I want to extend a special welcome to um, a number of visiting high school teachers who are with us today. They are the teachers of our first year humanities scholars students, and um, I especially welcome you today. But I also welcome various guests from the Maryland State's Arts Council. Um, so a special welcome to you as well, and of course to everyone else. Um, my name is Rebecca Bowling, and I'm the director of the Drescher Center for the Humanities. And this is our, I have to count here, it seems like we've had a lot of these already, one, two. Well, we had to cancel, unfortunately, one of our Humanities Forum events, the last one. But this is our fourth, then, um, of the season, of the spring. And we have two more coming up after this. Um, next week, we will have um, the Barker Lecture, which is sponsored by the Philosophy Department, and Margaret Little from Georgetown University. On Wednesday, we'll be coming to talk about morality beyond demands. And then at the end of the month, we have the annual History Department Low Lecture, um, and we are having Peter Wood from Duke University, who will be talking about near Andersonville, Winslow Homer's Civil War. So I invite you to both of those events. I'm um, to the various people that are glad I remembered to announce it, I think. Um, my role today is just to welcome you, but also to remind you of a couple of things and then to introduce the moderator and organizer of our panel, to whom we owe quite a bit. Um, I also want to, since we're here in the gallery today, um, I want to tell you about an upcoming exhibit. I mean, it is starting on April the 9th, so only days from today. Um, it's photographic memory, Civil War photographs selected from UMBC special collections, and of course, Peter Wood talk is somewhat in conjunction with that. Um, there will be a public program on Tuesday, April 17th, um, in which the History Department's Annie Rubin um, will be talking about myth, memory, and the American Civil War. And Tom Beck, the chief curator of the gallery um, and affiliate associate professor in visual arts, will be talking about Civil War photography as art and historical evidence. So those are things to be marking on your calendar and keeping in mind. Now, I would like to introduce to you Michelle Stefano, um, who if you've met her, you know, because she's a whirlwind of energy. Um, and <laughs> and she, she's amazing. Um, she's the program coordinator of Maryland Traditions, the folk life program of the Maryland State Arts Council, as well as the folk forest in residence in our American Studies Department here at UMBC. Dr. Stefano was awarded her PhD from the International Center for Culture, Cultural and Heritage Studies at Newcastle University in the United Kingdom in 2010. Her research focuses on the impact of transnational and national cultural policies at the local level. She's co-editor of the book, Safeguarding Intangible Cultural Heritage which examines local level initiatives to protect and preserve living cultural expressions and practices around the world. And it will be published later this month by Boydell and Brewer. So with no further ado, we welcome Michelle. Thank you and thank you, Rebecca. I'd also like to thank the Dresser Center for its support and sponsorship of this panel, as well as Dean John Jeffries somewhere in the back uh, Associate Dean Kathy O'Dell of the College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences, as well as the Departments of History, Modern Languages, Linguistics, and Intercultural Communication, and Language Literacy and Culture for their support. One last thank you must be given to Professor Carol McCann, who is the Chair of the American Studies Department, where I'm hosted as the Folklorist in Residence. Thank you to Carol and to her department, for their support and sponsorship of what looks to be a very interesting and lively uh, panel and open conversation. Indeed, I'm not surprised by this turnout. When it comes to the notion of authenticity or the authentic and how it is defined and used, as well as by whom, discussions can get very heated. Authenticity in many respects is deeply connected to our understandings of personal and communal identities. And with respect to cultural expressions, memories, and practices, it holds great significance, and it is often in heavy use in the larger public, folklore, heritage, museum, and tourism sectors. We'll just stop that, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's okay. 
I want you to pay attention to me. <laughs> <laughs> so as I was saying, authenticity holds great significance in the larger public folklore, heritage, museum, and even tourism sectors, as well as in our more commercialized forms of culture or popular culture. Nonetheless, it also holds great significance within cultural communities themselves. Maryland Traditions, the Folk Life Program of the Maryland State Arts Council, as part of its budding partnership with UMBC, has organized this panel too, as the title states, Approach this notion of authenticity. To highlight its importance and its uses in this rapidly changing world, and to discuss its problematic nature. It's a concept that is often applied and sometimes taken for granted, but it's certainly worth examining, even if one feels it to be too arbitrary or highly subjective or even elitist. It is a concept that we all can have an opinion about, and I do hope you share those. We have with us today distinguished scholars and researchers who deal with authenticity in their investigations and day-to-day -day work, particularly with respect to living cultural expressions and practices, whether that means researching musical traditions, the cultural meanings of particular sites or places, or working with communities, groups, and individuals in su to support their living heritage. So we'll first have our panelists speak for uh, just a couple of minutes each, and then um, we will open up discussions to all of you, all the participants here. And it is our hope that each uh, panelist will spark uh, a lively debate and share with us your experiences and reflections on this idea of authenticity, so no pressure. <laughs> uh, and so it is my pleasure to introduce our, again, distinguished guests. So uh, Dr. Rachel Delgado Simmons will be speaking second. And she's a researcher and head of the Smithsonian Folklife Festival Marketplace in DC. Under her tenure, the marketplace, which displays and sells the work of indigenous and folk artists from NGOs, nonprofit groups, women and farmers cooperatives, and from all over the world, has been the most successful in the history of the Smithsonian's Folklife Festival. Her explorations in authenticity combine her educational, professional experience and research expeditions that explore interdisciplinary topics including indigenous cultural studies, philosophy and religious studies, anthropology, native art, exoticism and tourism, native art markets, and popular culture. And from there we'll be hearing from Neil Silberman, who is the president of ECOMOS, the International Scientific Committee on Interpretation of Presentation. ECOMOS is the International Council on Monuments and Sites, with almost 10,000 members in over 110 count, uh, countries. He's also a member of the ECOMOS International, Advisor, International excuse me, Advisory Committee and Scientific Council. He headed the editorial committee for the ECOMOS Charter for the Interpretation and Presentation of Cultural Heritage Sites, which was ratified in 2008, I believe, in Quebec. Mm -hmm. Trained as a historian and archaeologist, his books and edited volumes on heritage and its effects on modern society include The Future of Heritage, Who Owns the Past, Memory and Identity, Heritage, New Technologies and Local Development, and Archaeology and Society in the 21st Century. From 2004 to 2007, he served as the director of the Anami Center for Public Archaeology and Heritage Presentation in Belgium. Since 2008, he has been on the faculty of the Department of Anthropology at the University of Massachusetts Amherst and on the staff of its relatively new Center for Heritage and Society. And lastly, we'll be hearing from Dr. Cliff Murphy, whom I work with at Maryland Traditions, and he is the Program Director of Folk and Traditional Arts at the Maryland State Arts Council. He also serves as Director of Maryland Traditions. Again, that's the State Folk Life Program. Cliff is a PhD in Ethnomusicology from Brown University. His dissertation was a history and ethnography of country and Western music in New England. And he has a book forthcoming on the subject from the University of Illinois Press. Prior to pursuing a PhD, Cliff was a working musician based in New Hampshire. His alternative country rock band gave, gained unexpected success in Italy, where they toured regularly and often appeared in authentic American-themed clubs that were bedecked with images of Clint Eastwood, Big Rigs, and Death Valley. True story. <laughs> but first, we will be hearing from Professor Theo Gonzalez, who recently joined the American Studies Department at UMBC in the fall of 2011. Before coming to UMBC, he was an Associate Professor of American Studies at the University of Hawaii. And prior to that, Professor Gonzalez taught extensively in his native home state of California. This marks his 21st year of teaching this year. 
Professor Gonzalez has authored, co-authored, and edited four books that address his overlapping interests in Asian American studies, as well as the political and social dimensions of expressive forms of culture. His work as a performer and musician has included the following. Gonzalez co-founded an artist-run recording label, played keyboards for several jazz and folk slash pop bands in the US, the Philippines, and Europe, and served as musical director for a San Francisco-based theater troupe. So please, welcome Professor Thea Gonzalez. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Next to the word authenticity, culture has got to be one of the most contested words in the English language. That latter term, culture, has been so contentious that one of the foremost thinkers of our time, the Welsh scholar Raymond Williams, muttered in 1979 about how he wished he had never heard of the damn word. <laughs> Sometimes I have the same reaction when I think about the word authenticity. And I think this has to do with my professional work as a musician and as a student of music. I don't think the term has been all that friendly to the best musicians of our time. We can think of when Dylan and Davis both went electric, how the music critics heaped a ton of scorn on them. We can also think about Argentinian music, how Astor Piazzolla angered purists of his day with his work that resulted in the Nuevo Tango. And yet in all of these cases, and no doubt thousands more, what, has, what was once heretical or inauthentic has now become merely a staple of our soundscape or the lobby of a Starbucks. <laughs> Too often, the term authenticity has held hostage a lot of the things in life that I've come to cherish about music, experimentation, innovation, and creativity. And I don't mean to bury the word today, but I'd like for us to think about how inadequate any term can be without some kind of grounded experiences and context upon which to reflect. I'd like to share with you an experience that I had with respect to that term authenticity. About 14 years ago, I conducted some field research in the Philippines. This was a prelude to what would become a larger project that would allow me to return to Southeast Asia several times, mostly to study, think about, and perform aspects of contemporary expressive forms of culture. I had originally thought I'd be working on researching some aspect of the contemporary music scene there in Manila. <clears throat> in the summer of 1998, I traveled with a folkloric troupe of mostly US-based Filipinos from Southern California. The group's name was Kaimaran Nanlaki, or KNL. Their mission had been to promote Filipino folk dance and music to US audiences. And their organizers, some of them born in the United States, others born in the Philippines, took great pains to bring Filipino-American dancers to the Philippines on a yearly basis, supposedly with the charge to learn from the source. In other words, to ensure that their theatrical presentations remained true to form, that what was presented in the United States was authentic. I tagged along with that group during their two-week battery of master classes throughout the Philippines, and then decided to stay throughout the summer on my own. I'll relate to you one incident that has stayed with me for years, and I believe it to be appropriate for today's discussion. What I became fascinated with was how was with an example of how a contemporary community adapted cultural practices to its unfamiliar and new settings. Bajau families had migrated from their homes in the southern Philippines to places further north, to a small village that we visited on the outskirts of Batanga City, a major port approximately 70 miles south of Manila. The Bajau are not only found in the Philippines, but throughout Malaysia, Indonesia, and Brunei. The reasons for their displacement has a lot to do with the hotly contested zones of economic expansion and political jockeying among armed groups all throughout the southern part of the Philippines. Our host in Manila was a celebrated choreographer by the name of Ramon Ubusan, a choreographer who had been taking visitors on exposure tours to learn some of the roots of Philippine dance. Even though he had access to all manner of resources in Manila, which is a funky metropolis of 12 billion people, Obusan's method for creating dances was quite simple. Observe and learn from rural and local villagers whenever possible. Obusan brought us to the settlement with the purpose of allowing us to interact directly with a group who had recently been displaced and whose cultural knowledge regarding Bajau dance would be relatively recent and unedited, or so it would, we would say, or so it would say. Obusan realized his own subject position as a bearer of urban privilege and status, and he wanted to make clear to the Bajau that the exchange would be mutually beneficial. Cognizant of the fact that the Bajau had virtually nothing with them in terms of material possessions, Obusan arranged to donate several musical instruments to the villagers from his stockpile of equipment. The question was, would the Bajau be willing to share their knowledge of dances um, 
And would these be similar to any of the ones we've been exposed to in textbooks and in faded newsprint articles? We arrived at the seaside village. About 40 families comprised the settlement. Our Manila host offered the instruments, made introductions, and identified those of us traveling from Los Angeles. The elderly Bajau women took to the instruments immediately, causing other elder women to dance. All of this seemed fairly straightforward, rituals of benefaction, gratitude, and reciprocity, but I wasn't expecting what had happened next. The doctor, or the chief of the village, dragged out a karaoke machine, a minus one machine. If you know anything about Filipinos, this is kind of like a religious article to us. <laughs> this minus one machine was powered by a small generator, and he, the Datu, inserted an audio cassette. For those of you that are younger, this is a... <laughs> you affix, it's a magnetic, well, you know. Look in the archives here, you'll see what audio cassettes are about. He put this audio cassette in the machine and hit play. Several of the younger Bajau women started to dance encouraging the American students and us, myself, to join in. Now the music coming through the speaker was blaring and it was distorted, but it sounded familiar, vaguely familiar. And leaning in more closely, I slowly began to recognize the song. It was one of the many versions of Los Del Rios' hit Macarena. <laughs> so this was a bit frightening, <laughs> ironic, and yet a delightful realization, I thought. In a seaside village on the outskirts of the Philippines, the Philippines' second largest port, our Los Angeles-based troupe, led by a champion of ethnographically informed folk dance, learned movements from a displaced southern Philippine tribe with a pop tune that was mass-produced for the dance floors of Sydney, Belgium, Rome, Seville, and Paris. And in all those cities, La Macarena was the number one single. Now, if some of us were having trouble that day in Batangas with what was supposedly an authentic rendering of the dances. It was not through any fault of the Bajau. Rather than regret that they did not have their instruments or their costumes with them, as a couple of US dancers lamented on our journey back to Manila, the Bajau's hospitality demonstrated, I think, a larger lesson, that cultural expressions are rarely pristine, unpolluted, or unresponsive to the times. Instead, the Bajau reminded us that culture also represents a transactional space in which the things that matter to us so much are songs and dances, lyrics, poems, stories, among other things, find ways to live on in the present by embracing compromise and discontinuity, as well as to continue making substantive meaning wherever one may call home. Now, I doubt if any one of the US-based choreographers that I traveled with would ever think of faithfully staging their own version of the dance that we saw in that Bajau settlement using a karaoke machine instead of a live rondalia or a kulungtang ensemble, so-called native instruments. Now that wouldn't be authentic at all, would it? No. Not here in the modern West. We prize and present folk culture as simple and simplistic, rustic and frozen in time, sometimes backwards, but never demonstrating any congruity, congruity with our shiny and polished surroundings. Those privileged enough to choreograph and compose Philippine culture in the diaspora make those kinds of decisions about the presentation of repertoire all the time. What we saw in that remote village would have to be actively forgotten, or perhaps even lamentably dismissed as an occasion demanding charity or pity. And rather than seize the opportunity to draft a choreography, which is an embodied form of writing, a choreography of survival, of organic adaptation and utility, to share with our audiences and communities in the United States, some of us would prefer instead to freeze our notion of the Philippines in some idyllic, rustic, pre-modern past. Now, I find that uncritical nostalgia for the so-called authentic to be troubling and to be deeply problematic. It's also terribly unsatisfying on an aesthetic level as well, as well as a visceral level, because the garbled and distorted music that I heard coming from that minus one machine on the shore of that village was some of the sweetest music I've ever heard. Thank you. Thank you. I told you it was 10 minutes. <laughs> Michelle told us 10 minutes.
I'm not speaking either. <laughs> I will help. So, Dr. Rachel Delgado-Simmons, please. I'm going to um, three very different research projects that explored authenticity. And typically, I don't read. I'm going to read for the first one. Um, I kind of just talk to everybody. So thank you, Michelle, for helping me. I'll just say next slide, please. So um, the first project I'd like to talk about is about an altar in Guatemala in an urban area of the Mayan demigod, Mashimon, also known as San Simon. Mashimon is a syncretic, sacred being to Mayan Indians, and he's believed to be the combination of the god of the underworld mom and the Spanish conquistador, Pedro del Alvarado. Um, he is part of the Mayan belief systems, and for centuries, he has become popularized, for, for centuries, but recently, he's been popularized as an icon for tourism, which is the largest industry in Guatemala. The presentation and representation of a Mayan religious figure is an integral factor of what creates histories for uh, one group, which are Mayan Indians, and, is, and creates um, authentic and authentic spiritual experience for those who are not Mayan, meaning um, non-Mayan Indians. Uh, next slide. There are three major shrines for Mashimon in Guatemala, and they're all in villages. He's cared for by a cofradía, which is a secret brotherhood of, of, of a religious group. He's also seen at festivals, uh, at elaborate processions, and elaborate rituals. He's often draped in garments. He is also seen as dressed in Western clothing, like a dark suit with you know, type of hat and sunglasses. He's typically surrounded by offerings, which include cigars, fire water, or what we call liquor, flowers, candy, uh, fruits, and other offerings. Um, next slide. However, the Mashimon I study uh, is not in a village, but in the city of Antigua, uh, the former capital of the Spanish Empire. Antigua is a city that is mixed with 16th century architecture as well as contemporary shops, restaurants, and cyber cafes that attract international tourists. However, Mayan Indians do not live in Antigua. Although they comprise about 60% of the population in the country, they are relegated to the periphery, to the rural areas of the country, and typically travel to Antigua to sell their wares or to work. Antigua is inhabited mostly by Ladinos, which are non mayans but a mix of Spanish and Indian descent. They're the dominant group that control the country. Furthermore, there was a 36-year 36, 36 civil war that displaced um, and many Mayan Indians, as well as many of them disappeared. Um, the Ladinos view the Mayan as an other, as a source of both nostalgia and disdain. In Antigua, Mashamon is rarely seen on display in the public domain. He's, uh, Antigua is often called the Disneyland of Guatemala, mm -hmm. and it massy ambivalence behind this aura of Mayan authenticity developed for tourism the country's largest industry. Although Mashimon has been in the altars of Mayan homes for many, many years, for centuries, today is part of the popular culture. Um, the, 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 the Mashimon I studied had a lot to do with exhibition practices and public display, and there were um, things I looked at as far as like, different forms of display, such as the institute or conflicts, etc. But I wanted to jump ahead to Mashimon now being displayed in a different realm of what we call the internet, in cyberspace. Since the late 1990s, Mashimon has also entered cyberspace, moving from the Mayan villages to urban areas as a topic of interest for tourists eager to post their visits for Mashimon shrines. From backpackers transmitting Ringo dispatches to a filmmaker scouting a location, visitors share online personal testimonies they describe as moving and touching experiences, authentic ones. Furthermore, online articles often do not describe Mashimon as a sacred figure. In a Bank of America exhibit, Mashimon is described as whimsical and displayed with Sicilian donkey carts. On LonelyPlanet.com, they list one of the Mashimon shrines as grisly geography and one of the top five must-see Adams Family style vacations. <laughs> <laughs> At LuckyMojo.com, Mashimon 
has magic hoodoo powders and lucky charms that are for sale along with skull prayer beads made of yak bone from Nepal and tiger penis amulets from Thailand. Um, the issues about Mashimo, oh, the next slide, are shared by many indigenous peoples. This is a quote from Von Deloria, who believes that identity um, of being Indian is something that is a, a strange phenomenon, whether you're Indian or not. And he relates this to hybrid sacred ceremonies, including things like sweat lodges um, and other new age activities. Um, but ultimately, does authenticity matter in regards to experience and belief systems? Um, next slide. A second research project I have to talk about is um, authenticity in an ethnographic study of <coughs> hula dancers at the Jersey Shore. <laughs> yeah, during the 1990s. <laughs> the site was Wildwood, New Jersey. It's a resort town between Atlantic City right. and Cape May. <laughs> Um, and I studied authenticity as well as ideas of paradise and experience. To begin, um, the early 20th century, the hula show arises from a need for people who visit Hawaii and they want to see natives in their real habitat. But a lot of Native Hawaiians lived in mountainous regions and there were not roads that were accessible for tourists. So organizers got together and decided to bring the natives to the tourists and created these hula shows which are very um, popular at hotels and restaurants, whether inside or, or outside. In fact, if they were outside, the mountains and the beaches and the trees added to this authenticity, as well as um, letting you know you really were in paradise. And of course, after World War II, the interest in Hawaii, as well as everything Polynesian, also peaked. But on mainland USA, hula shows were popular and they could be found in places like California and New York City. But my curiosity was, why are there hula dancers in New Jersey <laughs> and at the Jersey Shore? Um, and like, what are they doing there? So I began to under, um, examine this transition of like Hawaii to New Jersey, um, native dance to performance slash entertainment, and how the city is, is kind of played out here. Next slide. For example, one of the transition is, um, this is a hula show in Honolulu in 1941. It's inside one of these hotels, and they usually had sponsors for the shows, for example, like Kodak, because having a portable camera during this time period was you know, a big thing, especially if you're taking pictures of hula girls. But if you notice, the women are not wearing grass skirts, which are supposed to be traditional to the hula. They are cellophane or plastic skirts, which are not traditional. Um, and one of the reasons it, is this is because when you have a sponsor like Kodak, they want you to take great pictures. And under the lights and inside, silicone skirts and plastic shivered. So you got really good pictures. Um, these are the kind of changes I was looking at, like how things get transferred. And, and, and by the way, even the dancers in New Jersey, they wore plastic skirts too, sometimes as part of their performance. Even though they weren't inside, they were outside most of the time performing. So some of the things I found out, oh, slide seven? <laughs> Seven, eight, and nine, and then you can stop. <laughs> yeah. um, some of the things I found out, I'm, I'm going through this really quickly, is the dances were often short um, and simplified. They were not the long, elaborate sort of uh, native dances you would see. They were often done in smaller groups, not large, elaborate groups, but either an in individual or one or two uh, people. The dances were uh, really catered towards tourist consumption. In fact, if there was a song, instead of it being sung in the indigenous language, it would be sung in English. And better yet, if it was a song that had been made popular by Elvis Presley, <laughs> that was true. Um, the women wore very heavy makeup for the eyes and their hands because you're watching the hands. They often wore padded bras, long wigs, hair pieces. They used makeup to cover stretch marks on their stomachs because many of them had been, our mothers had been babies. They removed their wedding bands because you're supposed to be the available maiden and you're supposed to be single. Um, costumes were altered they, uh, for the stage as well as for lack of natural resources. You just simply could not get some of the things in Hawaii. You couldn't get them in New Jersey. So they altered them. That's a whole other presentation of costumes. <laughs> for example, um, coconut bras, which you've probably seen on the dancers, they would make them on their own and they would use shoestrings to tie them up. And I asked them, like, why are you using shoestrings? You know, that's not traditional, that's not Hawaiian. They said, well, you can wash them because they get sweaty when they dance, so you can, shoestrings are washable. And it was it kind of weird, too, because you would go to ShopRite or Acme, and they're over there looking at these coconuts and say, okay, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think they're big enough, you know, so. 
anyway. <laughs> they used to make, they were making a lot of their costumes. Um, there had to be a certain look to the dancers. Jane Desmond in Staging Tourism lists dozens of different looks for hula dancers throughout the decades. And they range everything from Latin America to Portuguese to Irish with a triangle, light, dark, etc. But for this group, the criteria was height. They had to be a certain height. They had to have a certain skin color. They wanted brown women with dark, dark hair. And um, they had to be authentic, meaning they had to be native from Polynesia. Um, Dean McCannell's stage authenticity also comes into play here. It is, after all, a show. And afterwards, the people would often come up to the dancers and ask them questions or take pictures. They would say, oh, we've had a vacation, our honeymoon, Hawaii. Oh, we loved your show, etc." And they also were um, shocked to find that the dancers didn't do this full time. You know, they were teachers. They, were, they had other professions, careers. They were shocked that they were married, that they had little babies. They were, they were you know, like real ordinary people. They were also, um, they would ask highly personal questions like, what do you wear under that? You know, meaning the skirt. I mean, they really asked like, what kind of underwear was worn. Um, in the hula show, you saw the environment as Hawaii, the one in Hawaii. But in Wildwood, slide, next slide. Okay. There's um, a set of motels, mid-century modern motels. And there was a collection of them called the Tiki, Tiki Motels. And they also uh, exemplified Hawaii. So this was all part of this research. I'm going to jump ahead and um, Oh, should it matter if the show is authentic or not? If the purpose is slowly entertainment, does it really matter? Well, when you ask the dancers um, about this, well, some of it is it's a job. Some of it is we just love to dance. But what the one question was about preservation of their culture as well as education of the group. Because there was something they were also trying to prevent. Next slide. Um, oh, that's another hotel. That's the Tahiti. That's actually a real picture from the 1960s. Next one. And then the next one, they're trying to prevent this kind of stuff. Next one. Um, next one. Yeah. And, and this. Wow. Next one. When I started this project, everyone always says, are you talking about real little dancers, not white people dancing? And I didn't believe it, because I'm used to native peoples. This is actually a group in South Jersey that you can hire. You can either hire the group that I was looking at, or you can hire this group. And it's almost the complete opposite of what I was talking about. But. Um, I don't have much time, but I wanted to, if you go to the next one, oh, the National Museum of the American Indian, uh, when they opened their new, their, their museum, they had a big festival for 2004. And you can go to the next one. I'm going to go through this really quickly. This is a procession of Native nations, um, which was the largest gathering of Native peoples in the Western Hemisphere in the history of America. Uh, the next one. So part of it was a, a market where they wanted to find authentic Indian crafts. And typically in the past, the Center for Folk Life, which had organized these markets, um, had curators who chose the crafts. This time, the museum wanted, oh, you can go to the next one, wanted uh, the, the Indians to select crafts. So a committee was formed. Um, and there were all kinds of things saying, like, what is a tribal affiliation? Well, that's problematic, because not all groups have a tribal enrollment card. They do not have official documents, for example, Native Hawaiians. Even until recently, the Piscataway, Maryland, are a state recognized tribe. Maryland and Virginia do not have federally, federally recognized tribes. So to say you have to be a real Indian or an authentic Indian, you have to produce a card, was a big problem for this. So they finally ended up with, um, oh, you can turn the next one. The, the one that says tribal affiliation in the merchandise. And we can go through these fairly quickly. Sure. These are some of the samples of the artists who submitted things. Um, fashion, you saw shell carving, uh, watercolor, corn maiden, um, computer graphics, the turtle, the Algonquian myth of creation, and all that, and as well as other types of jewelry. Um, but to make a long story short, there were rules, there were policies. The Indian Arts and Crafts Act of 1990 is based on 1934, which was actually designed by groups of white philanthropists who, dis who said what is quality and what is not. And this committee of Indians decided, well, that's what's going to be the criteria for judging it. So um, just because they were on the committee doesn't mean like it's necessarily authentic or tradition. There are things like policies and laws, tourism, etc. That, um, that are wrapped into all this. And if we can go to the last slide, the last, I'm going to go through these real quickly. There's also a search for a signature piece of art, the one piece of artwork that would describe this entire festival, this whole gathering of Indians. Um, you can see the banners, these stage drops with this artwork. And then 
um, even this t-shirt, which was just mass name, they're trying to get this t-shirt, which symbolized several other things. But the last one, this is a painting by Navajo artist Tony Abeta. And it was kind of controversial because other Indians disagreed that he should be the one to describe this. If you notice, there are things that <gasps> kind of look Indian, like bear claws and uh, hawks and turtles and so forth, but there are things on there, like an argyle pattern, looks like Venus's body head by Botticelli over there, some kind of odd bird. Well, the guy, you know, he wasn't what they call a reservation Indian. He was educated in the US at art schools, he studied in Europe, um, he's very well known. So a lot of people didn't agree that he should be the one to have this kind of artwork. Um, does it describe Indians throughout the entire hemisphere? 500 nations, you know, who came to this thing. And part of the reason I think uh, he was chosen was because it shows a diversity of cultures, not only among like Indians, but as well as like other people, whether they're black, white, Indian, etc. and that the museum wanted to move in this direction, not keeping something, you know, in the past. So um, in closing, these three research projects, uh, they're all very different. They're uh, kind of intriguing. And instead of asking, like, is something authentic or not, which is kind of a simple thing, is, to me it's more curious to find out why do you think that way, or what is it really authentic? There's, there's lots of things tied in with experience, memory, tourism, um, globalism, policies, laws in the government, as well as personal history and community, and in this case, uh, what tribal communities think. Thank you. And, and very enlightening, although, uh, as everyone has said before, authenticity is, is really an infuriating subject. And we're, we grow up thinking that it's, it's very simple, you know, that the, uh, the Franklin Mint sends you a certificate of authenticity, <laughs> and your porcelain uh, image of, of Elvis is authentic, uh, you know. But it really is a little bit more complicated than that in the field that I want to speak about, which is public policy about heritage. And that is to say, uh, what we've heard before, just a second, we'll close this, are really scholars that are, are working with the concepts and the, the activities of people. But there is, um, on the international level and on the national level of historical commissions and tourism, uh, real policy about how authenticity is judged. Um, it, it, it's connected with lots of things. I'm not going to deal with, with tourism now because, as we all know, authenticity doesn't, doesn't really matter that much in tourism. It's the, the attraction, and we can get into that. But there are other uh, aspects in terms of documentation, in terms of a feeling of a link of, of identity, and uh, of the administration of this, which, which uh, I want to bring to your um, attention. What we have here. Uh, is a group of tourists at Knossos, the famous uh, Minoan site on the island of, of Crete. And of course, it, it, it's a really important site in the history of uh, archaeology, as Sir Arthur Evans dug there from 1903 to just before the First World War, and uh, discovered what is now known as the Minoan civilization. He also created this, this visiting site. For the island of Crete, it's become sort of a, a symbol of, uh, of Cretanness in a way, and it is a World Heritage Site uh, listed on the uh, UNESCO World Heritage List. Uh, as you can see, there is a sort of a partial reconstruction of the of the Palace of Minos here, and I will, before moving on, will give you another bit of authenticity here. That, uh, you see, is the, the first reinforced concrete that was ever used on the island of Crete. So it's got many levels of authenticity, and in fact, I would, I would suggest that authenticity is a politically fought over designation that we either come to an agreement on and agree that it's a convenient fiction, or we fight over it, and that's what I want to talk to you about today. Now, there are a couple of central central definitions, central concepts 
that have come to the United States uh, in the, the National Trust for Historic Preservation and in the World Heritage List and in, in antiquity services all over the world. And it comes from something called the Charter of Venice, which was a group of experts that met together in 1964 and decided on basic terms after, after in the post-war era deciding how people should go about judging and restoring authentically. So it's a very simple equation. For the Charter of Venice and for many, many uh, heritage services and historic preservation groups, it's about what architects call the original fabric. How much of the original thing exists? Now, I'm not just talking about architecture, because when we're talking about intangible heritage, it is the idea of original somehow. Now, whether we nostalgically look and see the rural being more original than the urban or whatever, the idea is the equation of authenticity with how much of the old stuff remains. And this goes for archaeological sites, it goes for historic structures, in, in a sense, an index of their importance. Now, this was all really fine. Uh, and the World Heritage Convention was, uh, was accepted and began to be ratified in 1972. But under this definition of authenticity, what happened was that there was a huge cluster in Europe of Greek and Roman ruins and cathedrals and massive archaeological sites. And there came to be a, uh, an opposition from other people uh, in the world, Sub-Saharan Africa particularly, Southern, Southern and Eastern East Asia, Latin America, where there isn't, except for the, the Inca and the, uh, the Maya, there isn't this, this uh, massive um, piles of original fabric. And, and where it came from, really, was in, in Japan, uh, which is by no means uh, a developing country. By the 1980s and 1990s, they said, hey, wait a second. You say that authenticity is measured by how much original stuff you have and how far back it goes. But we have two centers, Kyoto and Nara, that are really Shinto cultural uh, centers. And the, the tradition has been going on for millennia. But there's only one small problem, that according to that tradition, every 20 years, every generation or so, it, it, the existing temples are completely destroyed and reconstructed in another place. So by the Charter of Venice, this is, this is garbage. This is uh, from, uh, you know, uh, 1983 or something. It, it has no value. So the result of NARA was, it was a, a new concept of intangible heritage. That maybe it was more about social significance, linkage to a kind of a tradition of craftsmanship, or in the case of, of music and art, a, a something that, get, that can, can be uh, found to continue. And you saw immediately a change in the World Heritage List with this particular place, which is really important. This is the Mostar Bridge in Sarajevo, which was completely destroyed during the Balkan Wars of the 1990s. And it has an immense symbolic value because it linked basically the Christian and the Muslim sides uh, of Sarajevo. Now, after the war ended, UNESCO sponsored a reconstruction of the bridge. And they did the best they could to be authentic in the sense of really documenting from photographs and plans and, and um, earlier uh, evidence exactly how the bridge was. Obviously, it was of great uh, social significance for the people of Sarajevo in the post-war period. And it, too, uniquely was, was nominated to the World Heritage List, even though it's a fake. But it was seen to have values of authenticity that go deeper than any one of these issues of original fabric, continuity, and so forth. Now, that sort of leaves us in a whole new era. And as, as we all know, here in the United States, the idea of having an authentic heritage is an important foundation of political legitimacy, as it is all over the world. 
especially in sub-state communities that want to uh, exercise their, their own dignity, their own respect, and so forth. So we have in the United States something called NAGPRA, which is the North American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, which, which is, is basically saying that if an artifact, particularly, particularly human bones, that are either in current collections in museums and universities or excavated in the course of archaeological work anywhere in the country, if there is a group that can make a reasonable claim to uh, a, a connection, then they must be repatriated to the, to the, uh, the people, the, the people that, that makes that claim. Now, there, I, I don't want to get into all the controversies there have been between scientists and native peoples, between native peoples and, and non-native peoples and so forth, but I just want to say that this adds another twist to authenticity. To impugn someone's authenticity is a political act as much as recognizing it. And I want to, I want to give a cautionary tale that, that really, that, that really um, illustrates this. In a, in a, a, it shows how naughty the problem of authenticity is. This is, this is a, a satellite picture of Barcelona. And, and uh, I don't have... Well, right here, if you can see the cursor, this is the old city of Barcelona. And up here in the green area is a, a mountain, for those of you that have been in Barcelona, called Montjuic, which uh, in Catalan uh, means the mountain of the Jews. Now, there were oral traditions that, in fact, during the Middle Ages, the Jews of Barcelona buried their dead uh, on this mountain. Uh, it has been tremendously built over um, since the expulsion of the Jews from Spain, and particularly for the expulsion of the Jews from Barcelona in 1391. As you can see, that was where the, the, uh, the um, various facilities for the Barcelona Olympics and so forth were, were installed at the top of this mountain. But there's an area down, down around here where archaeologists who were clearing a new road to the top began to discover uh, actual gravestones inscribed in Hebrew. Now, there's no question that from the, the style of the letters, the, the writing on them and so forth, that these are authentic pre-1391 gravestones. In fact, in the old city of Barcelona, you see some Hebrew writing built into some buildings and so forth. Anyway, the government of Spain, particularly the Ministry of Culture, it's not so much Spain, actually. It's really Catalonia, which, is, which is, has got its own uh, sort of local autonomy, was really interested in the multicultural history of Catalonia and thought that this was really a great project. And with the local, with, with the local Catalonians, um, they started to excavate until, out of the blue, a group from Brooklyn of Eastern European uh, extraction called the Satmar Chassidim, um, who considered themselves the most orthodox of the orthodox, began to make demonstrations and, in fact, put tremendous pressure on the Catalonian government to hand over all the bones and gravestones to them, which, which they subsequently did, and buried in the modern Jewish cemetery in, in Barcelona in a sort of square cement uh, enclosure so that they, they, would, they would be at least according to their religious beliefs. More telling even was a nearby site where another building road, mass graves of the medieval period were found. They were all jumbled together, all different, uh, you know, ages and genders and so forth. And what the archaeologists found was that this was the remains of the 1391 pogrom uh, in which the Jews of Catalonia were were expelled. There were all kinds of amulets on the babies and so forth. And this was this was the first time that that such a thing could be documented. Uh, but once again, 
the uh, the Hasidim from from Brooklyn came in and through political pressure and through their claim to be authentic, the, the authentic represent, representatives ended this. So I'll just end, end this talk with the central questions for authenticity really in public policy. Does authenticity lie only in scientific discovery and documentation? That's what we're, we're used to you know, uh, growing up with, the idea that the expert voice uh, is the one that can be most accurate. And the goal of authenticity is to really find out what it was like, what happened, and in the case of this 1391 pogrom. Does authenticity lie in the hands of those who claim to be representatives of all the past? Now, this is a very tricky question. It's whether one, from the expert voice, questions that, or whether we come to a, uh, a sort of compromise where we agree that certain people wearing certain costumes with certain claims are the representatives of all that went before. It's another question. It's especially difficult in the case of Spain, where we now know from, from DNA that hundreds of thousands of Catalan and later Spanish Jews converted to uh, Catholicism uh, at the time of the Inquisition. So who really does own the past? And what I want to say is that in public policy, authenticity cannot be a zero-sum game. It's not a question of it is or it isn't, as, as you see here in an argument between Israelis and Palestinians about who owns this land, whose land it is, and so forth. And what I want to show you is perhaps a new way, or a new way that we're thinking about it in terms of policy. Now, I'll be really quick and just finish right now. And that is, <laughs> The Venice paradigm sees authenticity as part of that empirical data. The Nara paradigm, the one of the Shintos, see, sees it within identity and tradition. The UNESCO par paradigm sees it within the rules of the conventions and so forth. But what we really have to look at in public policy, and for that matter in assessing uh, authenticity, is balancing all of them. Because empirical data and identity value tends to uh, be interested only in a certain ethnicity. Identity value and civil institutions leads to highly nationalistic kind of uh, commemoration. And civil institutions and empirical da data alone lead to like butterfly collecting and completely meaningless kinds of factoid uh, authenticity. So what we're doing in, in ECOMOS and elsewhere is trying in all the policies to understand the balance, the necessary balance of all three elements. Done. <laughs> So that leaves two minutes for you, Cliff. Right. <laughs> Sorry to have to follow that up. No. Um, all right. How are you all? Yeah, everybody okay? Okay. Well, oh, this is my first slot. I'm going black. So I'm talking about Johnny Cash. I'm not talking about Johnny Cash, but talking about country music, so I guess I'm starting on black. Um, <laughs> My name is Cliff Murphy. I began working at uh, the Maryland State Arts Council in Maryland Traditions in March of 2008. And as Michelle mentioned earlier, I arrived with an interest in country music at the regional and community level. And so I was excited when I arrived uh, knowing that Olavel Reed, who's a, uh, a great uh, singer, songwriter, banjo player, um, and uh, master of um, of adopting various quotes of authenticity um, was uh, from Rising Sun, Maryland, up in Cecil County. So uh, I wanted to find out if there was any sort of living uh, legacy of her music there. Uh, I got in touch with two of her nephews, uh, Zane and Hugh Campbell. Uh, this is Ola Bell up here in the, uh, in the upper corner, and those are Zane and Hugh Campbell in the bottom corner. Got in touch with her two nephews uh, and made arrangements to meet and record them up in Elkton. Uh, when I arrived, uh, Zane, who's the fellow in the black shirt, um, told me that he was surprised to hear that um, a folklorist was an employable occupation. <laughs> and he wasn't just being smart. Um, 
he, he said in his words, uh, I just read the New Yorker that there's no authentic folk music left in America. And, uh, and the article that Zane was referring to uh, had, had been published uh, just a, a few months earlier in, uh, in the New Yorker, in April of 2008. It was titled, The Last Verse, Is There Any Folk Music Still Out There? Um, and the article amounted to a very long review um, of a recent deluxe CD box set called The Art of Field Recording. And uh, this was um, a compilation of field recordings that had been made by uh, a University of Georgia art professor and sometimes folklorist, Art Rosenbaum, uh, over the course of several decades from the 60s onward. Um, and without intending to, the author of the New Yorker piece really summed up the prevalent narrative surrounding um, the discussion or the pursuit of quote unquote authentic American folk culture uh, for the past 150 years. Um, that industrialization, development, uh, commercialization, and multiculturalism uh, were rapidly eroding our, our authentic cultural foundations, uh, however exclusive the definition of our may be, uh, typically just English language uh, traditions. And, uh, and to paraphrase, the best that we could hope for um, really was that some strange folklorist may come along and record some of this music uh, before it disappeared. Uh, there's really never, rarely until very recently, um, talk of sustaining cultural traditions. And when I talk about this, I'm talking about it in terms of the public discourse rather than the academic discourse. Um, uh, there's really rarely any acknowledgement of the many vibrant folk traditions that carry on happily outside of uh, this debate of, uh, of how modernization, etc., are, are sullying uh, authentic culture. Um, and this is, uh, if you really probe at the depths of it, uh, ultimately it's a, uh, what I find to be a creepy, xenophobic, neurotic, and highly questionable uh, premise in the first place uh, when it comes to music in the United States. As his backdrop, as his backdrop uh, to this article, the author looked to the anthologies that had inspired Art Rosenbaum to go out and collect folk songs um, in the rural south. Uh, and ultimately, he, he turns to the Harry Smith anthology uh, of American folk music, which was released on Folkways Records in 1952. Um, it's an oversimplification, but this collection of records uh, in many ways spawned the 1950s and 60s folk revival that gave birth to stars like Joan Baez and Bob Dylan. Um, this was kind of a musical bible of sorts for that crowd. Um, and the Smith Anthology consists of commercial recordings from the 20s and 30s of genres then known as race and hillbilly music, or what today we call blues and country. Um, Smith found the recordings beautiful, romantically dark, quirky, and hoped to somehow, uh, that, that by people hearing this, it would enact some sort of positive social change. He didn't make field recordings, Harry Smith, that is, um, but the popularity of his anthology um, and, his, and, and some of his inspiration is due in no small part to earlier folk revivals, um, that of the 1930s and 40s, uh, spawned by, in large part, by the, the work of uh, field work collectors uh, like Alan Lomax, Zora Neale Hurston and John Work the Third, uh, some of who are, are, are pictured here, and uh, also of uh, folk song popularizers like Pete Seeger, who uh, literally grew up in the presence of uh, the Lomax field recordings and basically chose to make his life's work uh, singing these songs uh, to a national audience. And there you can see him in the bottom corner singing along with Ola Um Okay. Uh, these, uh, and, and, and Seeger was, was uh, along with Woody Guthrie, Sonny Terry, Brandon McGee, Lead Belly, and others uh, really worked to promote traditional music, uh, community-based folk musics uh, to a national audience, really searching for kind of like this new national identity. Um, these culture workers uh, like Hurston, Lomax, and, and others had been inspired by the work of John Lomax, uh, Cecil Sharp, and all of Dane, Dane Campbell and other folk song collectors from previous generation of the 1910s, John Lomax being Alan's father. Uh, okay, and I'm trying to, how's my pace? Doing great. Yeah. <laughs> For those of you who know me, I'm talking much faster than I know. <laughs> so these folks were out looking for, uh, for untrammeled or read authentic uh, regions of the United States to collect folk songs in, uh, particularly Appalachia. Um, African-American prisons, 
cowboy camps and small villages in the deep south and the southwest where popular music was thought not to have thrust its dirty neck. Um, Cecil Sharp, who's the gentleman in the upper right-hand corner there, uh, was from England, and he deemed living folk traditions to be a nearly lost cause back home. Uh, he came to the Kentucky mountains because he believed the communities to be so culturally isolated uh, that he would find unsullied Elizabethan era music and dance there. And he found it, um, but he ignored the rest of what he saw, um, at least in his writings, uh, which was things like Italian coal miners and African Americans and mountaineers who liked to play banjos and sing minstrel songs. Um, and so he, pre he, he presents a certain version of what he found. And this is something that, that uh, you can find in all of the work of everybody that we've seen so far, Lomax and everybody else. They were looking for uh, the oldest and the most authentic and rarely in their public presentations, uh, in their publications, in their anthologies, did they ever present the fact that these folk materials were really part of a larger repertoire that included both uh, popular music and uh, what we think of as folk or traditional music. So, uh, John Lomax, in some ways very different from Cecil Sharp, uh, he was interested in collecting cowboy ballads in the Southwest, um, and he also uh, did a great deal of pioneering work documenting uh, the folk song traditions of African Americans. Uh, and Lomax believed that both uh, working cowboys and African Americans possess this remarkable lyrical tradition that, um, that expressed something inherently American. Uh, and this is really based on a frontier identity um, of America. Lomax's work is uh, the direct result of the influence of ballad scholars that he studied with at Harvard University. Um, in the late 1800s, oh, there he is, right, this James Child, uh, a Harvard English professor, who kind of looks like a Beatrix Potter character, um, edited an exhaustive, an exhaustive collection of British and Scottish folk ballads. Uh, Child's protégés, George Lyman Kitteridge and Barrett Wendell, uh, taught ballad scholarship to a group of scholars and artists who went on to define uh, really what I think has become known in the popular imagination as the authentic uh, frontier American identity. Uh, these were people like historian Frederick Jackson Turner, uh, sculptor Frederick Remington, President Theodore Roosevelt, writer Owen Wister, whose novel The Virginian is considered the first Western, uh, and John Lomax, of course. And each of these students uh, produced bodies of work that express much the same thing, that the authentic American identity was forged along the frontier, uh, somehow becoming less European and more American. And the frontier was a place that the city was not, and rarely uh, foreign languages as well, foreign being not English. Child's work in ballad collecting was significant and showed a deep love of folk lyricism, uh, but much of the school of thought, the compulsion to collect ballads, to celebrate the frontier, and so forth, was brought about by a fear of changing national identity. Uh, Barrett Wendell, uh, one of Child's chief protégés, uh, bemoaned that uh, the Paul Revere house in Boston was starting to smell like garlic, um, and uh, that uh, John Lomax's, uh, that Theodore Roosevelt's um, introduction to uh, John Lomax's Cow Cowboy Ballads Anthology, um, quote, well, links cowboy balladry to Robin Hood in medieval England, um, and he quotes Owen Wister complaining about how, how uh, you know, American music and culture uh, reflects the ill-smelling saloon of cleverness of popular music. They had something with smell. <laughs> <laughs> the image of the folklorist along the frontier on the heels of dying authentic culture has appeared throughout uh, popular culture for nearly a century now, uh, beginning with, uh, with Soundies in the 1920s, depicting John Lomax and Lead Belly um, playing themselves, uh, to black exploitation films in the 1970s. There's Lead Belly himself. And there's the show poster from uh, the black exploitation film about Lead Belly. Uh, up through today with films such as Songcatcher, which I should say accurately depict the working life of a folklorist in the United States. <laughs> 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 
So, and I should also say that just uh, about three months ago, I read uh, in the Baltimore City paper, a local uh, journalist was lamenting the fact that, uh, that people no longer sing together. Apparently, he doesn't go to church uh, where people sing every Sunday. Um, and he wrote extensively in this article about Cecil Sharp. Uh, and his quest for pure culture and this time when uh, people sung merrily together. Um, there are multiple problems here. Um, each of these song collectors was after one thing, as I mentioned, the oldest, the best, the most authentic, the least popular. Um, and so Sharp, Lone Max, Hurston, and others only recorded partial repertoires creating a lasting impression that is entirely skewed. Uh, this, I, I believe, along with the anthologies that they produced, um, which again exclude vast cross-sections of uh, American society, um, it, it, pro primarily non-English, uh, people of non-English speaking heritages, um, creates a certain neuroses that things are, are corroding, um, that things have changed, that our folk singers today also sing popular songs, and how can they be authentic if that's the case? And all of these works are framed within the context of, uh, of America, um, our singing country, anthology of American folk music, Folk Song USA, the folk songs of North America. And this is, uh, Alan Lomax is one of his defining anthologies, which uh, excludes, despite being folk songs of North America, there are no uh, French or Spanish language songs. This notion of the authentic uh, persists today, not so much in academia, uh, you know, we may have debunked this notion in academia, but in the lay public, it still has a great deal of currency, uh, particularly in country music circles and other uh, musical traditions that really span multiple cultural communities. Um, and here's an example. Uh, where does country music come from? Geographic region. The South. Yes? Um, and. If you answered the South, you're in good company, despite the fact that country music has been uh, widespread working class social music across North America for over a century. Uh, the various corporate interests in Nashville in the 1950s uh, collaborated together to create a new unified brand, um, changing the name from country and western to country music uh, and associating it uh, primarily as a southern cultural export. Um, the primary author of, uh, of country music history is Bill C. Malone, a folklorist and historian, who in his, uh, in his book Country Music USA lays out uh, frameworks for authentic country music making. Okay, uh, His book echoes and fortifies these messages of, of the country music industry, uh, who had an interest in creating the impression that, uh, that country music, that authentic country, country music only came from the South. Um, and so, jumping, galloping ahead on my western horse. Um, by the 1960s, um, and I can answer questions about the particulars of, of, of some of this consolidation of industry, um, country format uh, stations started to pop up throughout the United States uh, on which uh, local and regional musicians who played in various regions, singing in various accents, um, who were known and local stars in their own right um, were supplanted by nationally uh, by, by Nashville-based nationalized playlists of music. So in places like New England, uh, where I grew up and did a great deal of my studies, um, even though you have over a half century of tradition where people are getting together and sometimes alternating songs between uh, English and French or English and German or English and Greek, um, or whatever the particular ethnic community uh, was in that case, um, people begin to sing by the 1970s with an affected Southern drawl. Um, and this, as you can imagine, uh, creates a great deal of resentment. Uh, people feel bewildered. People who hold this living memory of a time uh, when the local was still heard, when the local was still valued. Um, and this is a very extremely long quote by Jimmy Barnes, a country musician from Maine, who talks about how uh, his resentment over the idea that uh, cultural values in, in what he thinks of as country values uh, have been mined and, um, as, as, uh, and, and resold to locals as a cultural important. All right, so I'm wrapping it up. 
So how does this play out in Maryland? Um, artists like Zane Campbell, who straddle multiple genres, uh, much the same way that Lead Belly and others did, um, perceive themselves as somehow inauthentic because they fall outside of these spheres that have been established by places like uh, the Country Music Hall of Fame, by The New Yorker, by these various anthologies that I have mentioned before. Um, people, whether we like it or not, see themselves either authenticated or not, or inauthenticated through these various collections that have spilled out over time. Uh, and so what's our role in it? Uh, I, as I see it, uh, our job in Maryland Traditions, as a folklorist working in Maryland, is to document and celebrate cultural communities uh, on, uh, in, via individuals who are considered uh, to be exemplary or representative of, the com uh, of a given community uh, on that community's terms. Uh, and our work has to be done carefully, deliberately, and understanding that we play an unwitting, uh, that we play the unwitting authenticator uh, and anthologizer through our festivals, through our grant programs, uh, and through our museum programs. If done well, our work uh, enables us to develop a narrative counter to this one of cultural corrosion, one in which we can help reveal that there are multi multiple narratives, uh, that you have overlapping communities and traditions that, in the presence of one another, uh, can, uh, can invigorate one another by embracing or resisting dynamic change. Thank you. So, who would like to ask the first question? <laughs> <laughs> Jacob. Yeah, my question is from Ms. Delgado Simmons. Um, I would like to know what the uh, Catholic, um, commun not Catholic community, Catholic um, dominant sort of religious uh, institutions of the country feel about this community and what their response is to it. Um, in Guatemala and, and other parts of Central America, there's a certain belief system called, they call it folk Catholicism. And this is a merge of the Catholic Church with the primal belief system of the Mayan Indians. Um, those of you know how to religious studies, it's a polytheistic type of system versus the monotheistic. But what happens is, um, many of the, the Mayan Indians were, um, were sort of forced to accept Catholicism or you know, Christianity and comply. But if you go there and you go to these altars, because these, these Mashima altars, if you go to the villages, they're almost everywhere. I mean, they're in their homes, they're in the churches, they're in the stores. You know, the same way you've seen Buddha kind of somewhere in a corner. Mashima is like that. Um, it's very different because if, if you're raised Catholic, you understand the patron saints, the whole church setup, the whole um, system. When you go to these churches that are the mix, you see some of that, but you see a flavor of something that's very, very different. And it's, it's intriguing because, you know, in a kind of linear thinking, it's like, oh, that's Catholic, but no, it's not. You know, and sometimes it's both. The idea of processions, I think, you know, Aztecs, Mayans have always had processions, which is something you also see in the Catholic Church, you know, very elaborate kind of procession. So I'm not sure, like, at a national level, exactly how it plays out, but when you see it, there's almost like no argument that it should be this or it should be that. It's kind of like okay that it isn't either or, you know? And again, it is their belief system. And, and again, very different in the villages than in an urban area like Antigua. So I hope I answered your question. Please, Lisa. Um, I'm curious how those of you who are artists on the panel, um, how this notion of authenticity um, impacts your own work. Uh, Do you feel totally fake, or? <laughs> 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 no, I, 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 you go first. Go ahead. I find that it uh, it, it makes it difficult for me to, to it's made it difficult for me to name what I do, um, and uh, I think that. In terms of the music industry, you know, there's that that category of folk music, which I think the Indigo Girls and James Taylor and whoever would land in that, you know. Um, but I think that that's a different thing than what we're talking about today. Um, and so, what do you call yourself? Do you call yourself the thing that everybody else calls it, or do you call it the thing that you, in 
your head as a scholar think that you know. Um, uh, it's tough. Theo? Well, I've, I've faced so, um, some of this as, as a composer, or I've, I've, um, and I think as, especially as, as someone who's worked with, with groups and organizations that perform in, in concerts, uh, like say in, the, in, in something called an Asian American Jazz Festival. And at, at least in San Francisco or in Chicago, where a lot of these festivals are held, there's an understanding, especially among critics, academics, writers, as to what that means. There's a long history of Asian Americans, and um, the way that they've created and formed communities with African Americans, Chicanos, Latinos. The idea of an Asian American jazz milieu is something that you can take for granted in the Bay Area because there'd be enough of a crowd that would understand it. Uh, whenever I perform there, there, there's always at least a, a random reporter will wonder, well, why are you playing Latin music uh, as, a, as a Filipino? And think, well, you know, again, a lot, of these, a lot of these questions can be answered if we knew a little bit more history. And, and, and again, this is where my occasion to play music for a, a crowd of people it ends up turning into a history of the Philippines and having to explain why Europeans have been in the Philippines longer than theirs have been in America. And they're wondering, well, what's, there's nothing really odd or there should be nothing new about how Filipinos have encountered modernity. We've been encountering it since the 16th century. We've been singing songs of conversion and the glorification of Christian gods for many, many centuries. And so it's new to this reporter because it doesn't fit a pre-described, a, a, a prefabricated narrative of what an, a, a recent immigrant should look like, or what they should be thinking about, or what is the music of an Asian American performer. And I, a lot of this has to, we end up having to rely on, on folks such as Rachel and Neil and, and Cliff to, to help provide the, the deep contextual groundwork for, for linking our histories. And when we go back that further, we realize We've actually been playing with each other, for each other, for many, many years. I think about that, four, that 1391 pogrom uh, of Barcelona, and, and it's not a mistake or an accident that a century later, then in 1492, when Columbus sails out of Spain, that the Spanish government also ends up kicking out all of the Jews from the entire peninsula. How come we don't know enough about that? And yet there's a rich history of, of Jews, Christians, and Muslims in that area for a long time. When I lived in Spain, that's not what you hear. You hear how there was a, a Muslim occupation. Well, I mean, didn't they occupy it for seven centuries? <laughs> they call something, oh, they merely occupied it for seven centuries. I mean, how long has the United States been around? Well, we've been occupying it, I guess, for a couple. Uh, but it's not seen as that. There, there is a way to, un to assign a default culture, a default language, a default religion, as if to say that what really happened here before, the seven centuries before that, really wasn't as important as what's here now. So I, 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 there's a long way to get around that. You know, as, as an, I guess, an ethnic artist or an Asian American artist, you can't end up, um, if you use that title, yeah, I have to end up explaining much of the history. I, I, I would just uh, want to add to that, that uh, in fact, all this, this authenticity talk is uh, fairly new. And I think that you've, you've got to realize how closely it's tied to the emergence of the nation state uh, in the 18th century in Europe. Because an entirely new idea came about. And that was very different than the existence uh, of the mixture of culture, the multiple labels of culture, and so forth that you see in, uh, earlier in, in antiquity, like the, the Greeks and the Romans. There came this idea with the emergence of the, the nation state, whether it was Denmark or, uh, or the unification of Germany or Italy, that you have a sandwich. A sandwich of a clearly defined boundary, all the people living within it of a certain ethnic uh, uh, origin, a certain language, a certain national costume, a certain national cuisine, and that became normative. Now, the reason it became normative was, in, in, in a way, to justify this division in, 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 into nations. If you read even a fascinating book called The Discovery of France, you see as late as the, the, the middle of the 1800s, uh, the various regions of France were, were absolutely unintelligible to each other, from, from Brittany, to the, uh, to, to the Alps, to Picardy, and, and so forth. So what we got were these, these organizations called states that wanted to hom homogenize everybody and to be citizens. 
And if you weren't of that, you know, of that, um, then you weren't really X or something like that. Now the thing that spoiled all of that was reality and uh, especially movement. <laughs> Because today we have a really tricky problem. It isn't, isn't just the, the question that you have to explain why a, a, you know, a Filipino is singing that. I mean, that, that again is answering that voice that says, everybody stay in your box. But there's even a, a more complicated thing. With our world of diasporic populations, I was struck by your description of Filipino Americans going back to the Philippines as the source. Well, this, this diasporic existence violates all the rules. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, you're not really, really accepted, as long as you self-identify as a part of the adopted nation. And on the other hand, you have a kind of nostalgia that you want to have the homeland be sort of like this, this taxidermist dream, exactly the way, not even it's remembered, the way it should be, and it becomes, in a, a sense, the other of the modern existence. That's my life, Neil. Yeah, well, <laughs> good luck. I figured it out. You know, you know. Um, so it's really difficult. So we have to, you know, we have to develop. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm so glad that here in Maryland there's so much activity about, uh, you know, um, about making it okay to have multiple identities, and I go back to the beginning of, of, of your, your um, lecture with the whole idea of culture. Culture is this kind of expressive creativity that makes people happy, like, like the, the karaoke machine or, or however it's pieced together. And there is no one that has not always been doing that. What we perceive as authentic is a completely artificial, nostalgic fiction of one time when there was no time. When, it, you know, when, when all the things that we suffer from of uncertainty was in our mind static mm -hmm. and achievable. But you can never achieve that. You know, you know, nostalgia is, um, in our world, has come to replace rootedness as the basis of existence. So we have to keep that in mind. I want to add to um, something Theo and Neil said about this time period, like when does something become authentic? For example, with American Indians, is it authentic prior to conquest, prior to English settlement, Spanish conquest, and why is that time period more authentic than, let's say, the 1800s? And, and when I worked with um, American Indians, there were things sort of like, like glass beads. Well, they didn't make glass beads here in North America. They came from Russia, I believe. Um, even when you speak to American Indian artists now, a lot of the uh, turquoise or the stones they get, they'll tell you, oh, they're from Syria, or they're from the Middle East, and they're not from here. So, or even if you see the regalia uh, of powwow dancers, there's mirrors. Well, these are not found in North America. They never have been. They were traded. So what, why is that authentic? Yet if you see people who say, oh, his outfit's more authentic than yours, or how dare you put that on your regalia? Well, why? I mean, what's the time period? And it has to do with this sort of integration, which has been going on for thousands and thousands of years, people don't realize. But um, going back to this whole purity idea, um, where I work at Smithsonian, I'm still working with Marketplace, we threw out the world. Um, we have a lot of curatorial oversight on what happens. We have people who are experts in these fields, who can, who can give us, et cetera. But we do get in trouble. In fact, when I was talking about the American Indian um, panel, we got hate mail. We got people who said, how could you do that? That's not, how could you pick those people? They're not even real artists, and how dare you? I mean, some of it is not pretty at all. I mean, we get a lot of criticism. Um, yeah, hate mail is a good word. Particularly for the American Indian one, when only 40 people could be selected for those booths in that market. And they said, oh, the museum is here. It's our museum. It's got over 500 nations in the Western Hemisphere, but only 40 were represented there. Mm -hmm. And so we got a lot of, I mean, chiefs, from tribal groups were writing in and saying this, all kinds of things. Why wasn't I picked? That's authentic. According to the Indian Arts and Crafts Act, it's authentic, you know? So, you know, it's, it's, it is very difficult. It's not easy. Well, we just have a couple minutes. I want everyone to enjoy uh, the refreshments in the back uh, and also have some other people speak, but please click. Um. <laughs> 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 I need to be quiet. I guess. <laughs> 
it's you know, I, I, intellectually, I like to think that 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 you know those of us who are up here on this panel live in a world where we somehow move past this notion of authenticity, and yet, you know, Michelle and I are in in uh, the position of being a part of a program, and, and uh, Rachel, you as well, where you are. Uh, part of an organization that is recognizing um, various forms and practitioners of cultural expression. Well, we're adding value. <laughs> I mean, that's what we do. Okay. We valorize. Okay, and that's and that's fine. Um, it'd be a problem if I didn't think that was fine. Um, uh, but there are, there are instances that fly in the face of our work where we are confronted with things that we don't present, mm -hmm. and we don't present it for reasons, you know, and sometimes it's because there are, I mean, there, how do you deal with the issue of kind of post-authenticity and yet the reality of cultural ownership? Mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> if anyone has any answers, that yeah. would be great. Yeah. Yeah. What would a cultural policy that would address that look like? It, well, I mean, th there are a couple of things bound up in this, and of course, there's the economic interest, and, and you know, there's, there's almost a, a contradictory um, problem in, in how we pre publicly present culture now. On the one hand, we want to conserve it, and on the other hand, we want to consume it. It's it's the classic case of uh, wanting your cake and eating it too. So that that obviously the the, the economic power is going to, whether it is hula dances or whether it's a certain kind of uh, art form that looks authentic, the market sort of drives that. But I think that the real key is to, uh, is to cultivate the memory and cultural muscles of people in the grassroots and to go from product to process. <coughs> Instead of um, typologizing, to really encourage participation public discussion of things like authenticity uh, and, and real, real creation. Because, because as, as I was, was going to say, that, that I am now failing to see the difference between culture and heritage. It is cultural creativity. And you know, with the widening uh, categories of officially recognized heritage, it's very hard. The only thing that one might point out, and this is something Theo tells me, is that we tend to separate art from heritage with the question of authorship. That if you can, if you can connect a particular person with a particular product, then that's art. But if it's somehow uh, sort of, you know, dissolved in a, in a communal identity, uh, then it is heritage and authentic uh, social expression. And, you know, <coughs> as everyone has taught. This is, this is real tough business because it is now very much tied into political legitimacy. Mm -hmm. And uh, whether it is subgroups or subgroups or nations or whatever, it's a problem. I just want to bring up one more thing before we go enjoy the, uh, the uh, reception. And that, that, that was, Cliff, that you mentioned. Um, authentic uh, is seen as exemplary or typical. They're really two quite different things, you know? I mean, it's, it's hard to know. I mean, that has been the, the, the challenge of, of heritage experts in, in architecture, archaeology, and so forth. Whether you're looking for something that is, becomes the standard, you know, like Greek art or something, or whether it is something super vernacular, like, uh, like those travel posters of, of Hawaii. These are also issues. Look, the point is that we just need to put away this, this idea of there are categories of authenticity that I mandate and there are, there are not. You can't find it. It's like life itself. It is this ongoing, evolving expression of identity. And you might like some, you might not like some, but they're all sort of authentic. Even Disneyland is authentic in its own way. <laughs> Any last comments? <laughs> Any last comments or questions? <laughs> thank you, Bonnie. Well, thank you. It's